Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 61. For the Money, the Medieval Commercial Theatre. Last time, the secular theatre provided just a bit of fun to get away from all that serious religion, biblical stories and the threat of eternal damnation. The religious cycle plays and the morality plays certainly dominated in the early period and remained a strong presence right up to the Reformation. The theatre of worship, as some commentators put it, was the dominant form and religion the driving force. That form functioned on a largely amateur model, with, as far as we can tell, relatively few professionals or semi-professionals being involved. But when we see the rise of the travelling player in the mid to late medieval period, we get a different model, something that's much more commercial and professional. Once those professionals began working in the great houses of the European aristocracy and gentry, another new form of drama, the scripted playlet or interlude, emerged. Like Roman mime and pantomime, the subject matter and tone of the interlude could be very varied, depending on the site of the performance and the audience. Some of those constraints would just have been about the available space and the practicalities of staging a scene as the guests rested between courses. Perhaps no real challenges there, as theatre professionals have, since Roman times and probably before, been adaptive and willing to expound their art under whatever circumstances and constraints they're presented with. More serious was the judgement of what should be performed, with a view to how it would be received, given that the sanction of a local noble could result in being thrown out unpaid or a night in prison or worse. The actor's life was, as ever, a precarious one. But probably we should not separate the development of the various forms of religious drama too much from the commercial professional theatre. We've seen in the development of the cycle plays, the saints plays and the morality plays that as they expanded they became dependent on the financial support of the guilds and quite possibly on donations and other support from the gentry and aristocracy. The requirements of supplying stage sets, props, costumes and the sometimes extensive stage machinery involved significant financing. And in some cases, that was on a regular annual basis. I've already mentioned some of the examples where the guilds were feeling the financial strain and asked for some relief from the expense of the cycle plays. And the scale of a production like The Castle of Perseverance really speaks for itself when we speculate about the costs of a significant production. There's also good evidence for direct remuneration of at least principal actors and some of the craftsmen who put sets, props and stages together. This may all have grown out of a voluntary desire to extend religious ceremony to the glory of God, but slowly commerce worked its way into the model. That change probably started as soon as the church decided that performance could expand out of the strictly Latin liturgical context. Once laymen were involved, expansion of the plays, and therefore ultimately the costs of the plays, was probably inevitable, however undesired it might have been by the church. This was all still in the name of God, and the shift from the amateur, voluntary and charitable model was surely slow. Exactly how slowly, or depending on your point of view, how quickly that change to a more overtly commercial model happened is difficult to say. But broadly speaking, by the 14th century, there are financial records relating to the production of plays from ecclesiastical and civic account roles. So it's reasonable to think that by then there was sufficient concern for the financial aspect of the productions. That's not to say that what we have is any individual with a specific role that we would now call the company accountant. These accounting roles are records maintained by church wardens, guild accountants or town clerks, and the theatrical records are only one element of the financial matters that they were concerned with. And to qualify this further, we shouldn't assume that the church was against such commercialisation. We've already seen that the church was adept at taking in the secular, even the pagan, the ancient seasonal ritual and appropriating it for the service of the Christian message. Doing the same for mimetic art was not such a big step. Yes, over the centuries the control was slowly loosened and the secular interlude and the play were possible, but the framework they were produced in was always Christian. But when does any idea of commercial gain come into this? Records from Durham Priory show payments made to minstrels of our Lord the King in 1300, and in 1310 payments were made for cutting of a fool's surcoat. 
These are some of the earliest records of payments, but, of course, there may have been payments made earlier that went unrecorded or have been lost. And this record is not clear as to if it was a special one-off payment, or even a gift, rather than a regular fee. Perhaps we can assume that players and entertainers have performed for a long time with the cap out for a gift, a voluntary payment, making them, we would say, buskers. Also, I think we should acknowledge that such donations might be set at an expected level. The idea of the suggested donation is not new, so the line between this and the set fee is a blurred one. In fact, there are only clear records of a formal fee from the late 14th century onwards. Payments to actors who performed in the Corpus Christi plays at King's Lynn in eastern England are recorded from 1385 and in 1406 the priests in Lincoln paid money to buy costume material for a play of the prophets. And in 1420 they paid eight shillings and eight pence to pay for unspecified items needed for a play. And where there is expense there has to be income. In addition to the contributions made by the guilds, at about the same time we see mention of the collection of income, either from the sale of seats as in Valenciennes and Lucerne, or through a pageant tax as in York and Coventry, which was known as pageant silver. From several venues there are records of local produce being gifted to the church and sold to raise funds for the cost of producing plays. Income was not only generated from donations, voluntary or otherwise, and the entrance fees, On the continent, it was common for actors who were performing in the plays to sign a contract and pay a deposit that would be forfeit if they failed to fulfil their obligations. Now that is, I think, a particularly interesting development, as it seems to recognise that performance was of some benefit to the actor and was not just for the glorification of God. If an actor was willing to risk a deposit to make a financial commitment to the production, it suggests that they were expecting some benefit from that involvement. It was perhaps a way of improving their standing in the community or promoting their business if they were an amateur, but we might also venture that this could be a professional investing in the furthering of his career. Even when a deposit was not required, there were risks. Fines were levied on the guild or individuals who failed to produce a play, turn up for rehearsals or made a poor quality presentation. In 1390, guilds in Beverley, Yorkshire, were issued with a fine of 40 shillings for failing to produce their plays. Conversely, in 1531, the guilds of cardmakers and the guild of saddlers had appealed to the city council for release from the burden of the costs of producing the plays, as the charge is, and like to be, more ponderous and chargeable to them than they may conveniently bear or sustain in short term to come, unless provision for a remedy might be speedily had. It's worth emphasising that that request doesn't seem to be indicating any reluctance on the part of the Guild to present the play, and that it's purely a financial issue that's the problem. And I should also note that the plays were not the only kind of civic entertainment that made a call on the purses of the merchants and craftsmen and citizens. There were tournaments, town pageants and other celebrations that required funding. Ever so often, there were extraordinary events too. In England in 1501, there were official celebrations in the City of London for the marriage of Catherine of Aragon to Prince Arthur, the heir to Henry VII. The several tableaux that were erected had to be paid for by a special tax levied throughout the city. The couple were only married for five months before Arthur died, and Catherine was deftly passed on to the second son, now heir to the throne, Henry. But I guess you know how that story ends, so I'll move on. The cost of a pageant at the time was said to be about £120, and we can assume that the expense lavished on this London pageant for a future queen was a lot more. The value of the currency from such a long time ago is difficult to estimate, but £120 was approximately the wages of a skilled tradesman for six years, and could have bought 60 cows or 15 horses. About this time, we begin to see records of the actors themselves becoming concerned about financial obligations of producing plays. There's an example of a contract between four players from 1486. This troupe was based in Paris, and their contract marked the beginning of a year-long agreement to work together, playing farces and other forms of entertainment, at banquets, dances and other feasts. They committed to an equal share of all the profits, and to be honest with each other about any obtained benefits, without hiding anything from each other. The contract then explicitly states that any income will be equally shared, 
whether it be earned individually or as a group, and that none of them would perform for another company without the consent of the others. If one member of the quartet was unwilling or unable to perform, and his absence caused the loss of income for the others, then he was bound by the contract to make suitable restitution for the loss of income. Any breach of the contract could result in a prison term or a fine of two gold crowns. When the monks of New Romney spent three shillings and four pence to buy paper for the writing of parts of a play, they were spending perhaps £40 in today's money. There is also a record of a clerk being paid 12 pence, so 10 or 15 pounds, for writing a play, which seems a bit mean by any standard, but we have no knowledge of the expertise of the author or what he was required to produce. In France, Canon Pra received the more generous sounding 255 florins, which is something like 2,000 pounds today, for writing the play The Mystère des Trois Dômes. This play was produced in 1509 at Romain sur Isere. The account register for the production survives and provides a view of how the author, town authorities and the players interacted to produce the final version. The script, which has also survived, is judged to be a second copy, including amendments and censorship of the original script. From these layered details in the script and the accounts, a timeline for the production has been created. In July 1508, Canon Pra was commissioned by the town authorities to write the play and six council members were appointed to oversee his work. In mid-August, the first draft was reviewed by the council members, but there was a problem. A known playwright, Monsieur Chavalet, was commissioned to collaborate on the work. But again, there seemed to be more problems and just ten days later he resigned from the collaboration. Three months after the first commission, a copyist was paid the first instalment of a fee for copying the player's parts. In total, he received 15 florins for his work. In early December, the first full copy of the play, which is about 11,000 lines long, was completed and bound. On the 23rd of December, the copyist was paid for completing the player's parts, and rehearsals began, presumably with an immediate break for Christmas. During February 1509, the Council Committee of Six reviewed the original play and made amendments, which led to the author and a copyist making a new set of players' part copies, starting on the 1st of March. Rehearsals continued, presumably incorporating changes as they became available, and in early April, a new master copy was started. The performance of the play took place over three days, and each day's performance was allocated to a different copyist to transcribe. On May the 9th, the construction of the stage set started and on the 11th, Mr Chevalet was re-engaged to review the roles of two tyrants in the plays as they included violent acting and strong language. He took two days over his review and was paid 27 florins for his total contribution to the play. The play was performed on May the 27th, 28th and 29th. Now if we assume that this example is typical of at least the larger productions, then we can see quite clearly how collaborative this process was. The author is more a committee than an individual, and why the need for financial control had become so important. Allocating six council members to the oversight of the production suggests that this was a very important civic event, with no doubt reputations riding on its success. The biggest expense was for the stage, the set, the stage machinery, the props and the costumes. Although some element, and in some cases, could be provided by the responsible guild at a cost price and be absorbed by them, for the other elements it was not so easy. The goldsmiths could fashion the gifts of the magi, but some guilds would have no skills associated with their allocated play and would have to have brought in some required skills. As the use of stage machinery and props and costumes became more elaborate, specialists and those with experience of previous productions could be paid for their services it's probably safe to assume that the more elaborate the plays became, the more expensive they became. There's even a suggestion from continental Europe that in the later period there was a sort of arms race between the guilds as they vied to produce more and more impressive productions, and on occasion overstepped themselves. In Rouen, in France in 1491, the city put out an appeal for private donations to pay off the city's creditors after that year's festival. The larger festivals in the big European cities in the later period took a lot of organising and relied on the collaboration of the church, the state and the tradesmen of the city. 
The church may have abdicated responsibility for financing the festivals, but retained their strong control over the subject and the scripts, as doctrinal matters were always to be questioned. Some form of censorship of a script was common, and at times entire plays were rejected and prompt books destroyed to prevent further production of a particularly offensive piece. The state, in the form of the city council, had an equally strong interest in controlling the festival, as they drew large crowds and therefore touched on questions of civic regulation and keeping good order in the city. As ever was, but particularly in the late medieval period, a large gathered crowd was always a dangerous thing for civic authorities, and containment of a crowd and controlling its behaviour was always a concern. The guilds were responsible to both these authorities, which no doubt conflicted at times, and were the main funders of the festivals with, at times, a keen interest in reducing costs as much as possible. This arrangement gave the city council the greatest degree of sway over the festivals. If they chose to curtail the expense, they could instruct the guilds to do so, or if they needed to curry favour with the church, they could increase the revenues through the seat prices or taxes levied. The potential for some disagreement between these parties was always there, but only really came to a head in the period of the Reformation after about 1530 when the divide between state and church began in many parts of Europe. Broadly speaking, those who retained the Catholic faith wanted the place to continue and grow to promote the old Catholic message, while the new Protestant areas at first wanted to use the place to promote their agenda and then, with the growing influence of Puritanism, wanted to see them banned altogether. More of that when we conclude on the medieval period, but for now, the point is that the fact that the city councils had in the most practical way, most control over the festivals, meant that when the religious affiliations of a city were being decided, the city council often sided with the most numerous or prominent faction. In the final analysis, the city was most interested in the prosperity of the city, so trade and commerce, and not its religious affiliation. As the clerics and other religious fought amongst themselves, the city, and therefore the guilds, were not inclined to fight hard to preserve the tradition of the religious play. And the poor old actors and playwrights were caught in the middle of all of this and had no way of producing large-scale theatre without the support of both the church and the city. The desire to act was still there, probably the desire to glorify God was still there, but now you had to choose the flavour of your religion and that choice could and often did have a significant impact on the way you could live your life or indeed the means and proximity of your death. So the initial decline of the religious play in the middle of the 16th century was more a question of the failure of the means of financing the plays than from a lack of desire to perform or produce them. That demise was at least somewhat balanced by a rise in the professional player troupe taking smaller productions on the road and earning a living while on the move, avoiding unwelcome parts of the country and the perils of the road and, of course, outbreaks of plague. Travel was safer if you were a player attached to a lord, but there the financial model was different. As a lord's vassal, you were probably working as an entertainer for only part of the year and would otherwise be engaged on other tasks that benefited your master's household. Board and lodging may still have been very basic, but at least they were secured and your lifestyle was less precarious than it was for many. It's likely that while acting as visiting entertainment in other houses, the employed entertainer could earn extra income for themselves, and at a decent level, so to travel in this way, in the service of a lord, became quite common. Perhaps this is the first truly professional actors and entertainers that we see since Roman times. Where the actor in the lord's service was singing or reciting or acting in interludes, there was no sense of this being a religious obligation, or for the collective benefit of the membership of a guild. This was, in the broadest sense, an employed person. Although, given the indentured nature of service at the time, we might see this closer to slavery than proper employment. And we should be careful not to romanticise that lifestyle. It was the lord and master who had the financial freedom to keep a troop of actors and entertainers and use them as he would. There's no consideration of acting being a profession amongst the public in general yet. That was still some way off even though there were professional troops presenting interludes and other plays. Those in service of a lord were considered household servants, a fact emphasised by their need to carry letters of authority from their master and his colours in their clothing as they travelled, and those travelling around with no affiliation were considered only a slight step above vagabonds and were treated as such. 
The player in service may not have been quite a professional in the modern financial sense, but they probably were becoming truly professional in their art. These were no longer the amateur called on once a year for the cycle play, but people who performed regularly and with an established repertoire of plays and interludes that they could call on as required. As well as acting ability, many would have carried the additional skills, singing, dancing, juggling and acrobatics, that would have been individual specialisations in earlier times. And that ability to take on multiple roles within the small company probably also developed about this time. The model of the company performing different plays week in, week out, a model that carried into the Elizabethan period and forward into the repertory system in more recent years, started here and became the mainstay of the professional theatre for centuries. Because it wasn't governed by religious structures, the interlude gave the erstwhile professional the space to expand and experiment and develop in a way that hadn't been possible before. Now character and relationships could be explored, the aside developed, the stage business crafted to a more intimate setting. But I have to stress that this, like so much in the medieval theatre, was a slow process. Many interludes were no more than short morality plays or religious dramas that didn't develop on from the cycle or morality plays. Typically, they opened with a prayer and closed with the singing of the Te Deum. But for those inclined to explore the dramatic art, there were possibilities. The type of travelling troupe that performed interludes and could be self-funding on a small scale are just the type of players who turn up in Elsinore Castle as Hamlet is considering how to avenge his dead father. They are a travelling troupe who are appearing by appointment. They are expected and greeted by Hamlet as old and revered friends. They arrive with a repertoire of plays but are happy to adapt to circumstances at the request of their host. The lead player can bring in speeches as required and they set up their stage in the best space, the Great Hall of the Castle. Any set to suggest the orchard where the murder occurs is basic, a tree on a backcloth maybe. No master carpenter needed here. The troop travels light and costs are minimal. Bed and board are at the gift of their host, so best not to offend. In Shakespeare's version of the travelling troop, the young Hamlet, an amateur actor himself, rhapsodises over their performance. The old Polonius, also a former amateur actor, is nothing short of contemptuous of their efforts. Such is the actor's life. And on that note, we should consider the amateur as a distinct from the travelling troupe, the full professional of their day. Hamlet and Polonius have indulged, or perhaps we should say have been indulged, in amateur acting, and they're not the only Shakespearean examples. The troupe in A Midsummer Night's Dream are called hard-handed men, as they stumble through their performance for Theseus and the young lovers. The near-disastrous pageant staged by the schoolmaster and the curate, that is, the culmination of Love's Labours Lost, is a similarly harsh portrayal of the amateur actor and director. Shakespeare was not, it seems, a big fan of the amateur, and he, of course, was speaking to his post-medieval experiences, but also looking back a bit. The late medieval amateur is evidenced in a 1591 letter from one Samuel Cox to a friend, where he writes of Certain artisans in good towns and great parishes, as shoemakers, tailors and the such like, that used to play either in their town halls or sometime in churches, to make the people merry. Samuel continues by commenting that audiences were admitted for free in this situation and the amateurs funded the costs of their apparel and other necessaries from church wardens and the richer sort. So, an amateur dramatics company who were funded by local donation and who performed for the enjoyment of their fellow townspeople. But to get back to the commercial model, there's some evidence that specific incomes were allocated to finance plays and other performances. Records from mid-15th century Essex in eastern England say that 40 shillings was raised per annum from the sale of grazing rights and set aside to fund community productions. From the town of Malden, also in Essex, at about the same time, there's a record of travelling players being remunerated from similar funds, with, we assume, any balance remaining in the town funds. Outside of the larger towns and cities, a favoured model was for small parishes to combine funds towards a festival held in a single place to serve all of their needs, and these included the presentations of plays, mirroring the larger towns and city festivals on a reduced scale. The records are never complete enough to give us a good idea of the complete cost of productions, and given the wide variety of productions and difference in scale from city to village collective, and indeed even from city to city, any comparison of overall costs and income would be meaningless. 
what we do get are some interesting little nuggets, like the records from Bungie in Essex from 1550, where as well as the more common payments for copyists, papers and hiring of scribes, we also see expenses for hiring costumes, wigs and props from other local towns, and payment for the expense of sending people to collect and return these items. And uniquely, there is a payment of two shillings for hiring a comedian for his pastime before the play and after the play on both days, and a payment of a night security guard for watching the scaffold and saving of all things. For the artist, the question of profit and loss is an ugly and unwelcome one. But once theatre moved out of the church and away from its benefice, money did come into the question. We have a few records of profits made or losses incurred from individual productions, but we might assume from the prevalence of the play productions over the years that many did make a profit, or at least losses that were considered justified. I've already mentioned some of the complaints from the guilds about the burden of costs at one end of the scale, but towards the other end there's a record of the play of St Swithin presented in Braintree in Essex in 1523 costing £3, one shilling and four pence, with associated income of £6, 14 shillings and 11 and a half pence, a healthy profit in this case. Two years later, they produced the play of St Andrew on a similar budget and made a similar profit. And then in 1535, the budget was more or less doubled for the play of St Eustace, but the profit quadrupled. Whether it was just the increased spectacle of the play that generated more interest and income, or other changing social circumstances, we can't say. But the implication is that the big production always had the potential to pull in the crowd from far and wide and make a healthy profit for the town. The generally held view is that the truly commercial theatre does have its origins in the medieval period, but that it did not come so much out of the religious plays that were subsidised to one degree or another by the church and then the guilds and others, but that it comes out of the interlude, the indentured player and the freer spirits who made a living travelling the land and entertaining. Whether cleric and town clerk concerned themselves with the financial management of the civic religious plays it was the leader of the troop who had to concern himself with profit and loss. Along with the ancient skill of learning many roles, gauging and adapting to an audience, and performing, the travelling player had to also be capable of negotiating a good deal and keeping an eye on the bottom line. That may have been more about worrying how few coins there were in the kitty and where the next meal was coming from rather than filling the town or church coffers, but it was a necessary skill and one that would play its part in years to come when the travelling players were allowed to settle in permanent homes where long-term funding in an uncertain world was a major concern. Next time, I'm going to do my best to sum up the medieval period of theatre history and draw together the major themes that we've seen in this period as we reach the end of the third season of the podcast and prepare to move on to a new phase of theatre history. In the meantime, if you'd like to support the podcast, please post a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts or go to patreon.com for more content for a small monthly fee. Also, you can join the Facebook group and follow the podcast on Twitter. Any contributions go towards offsetting the costs of hosting the podcast and are gratefully received. And don't forget to have a look at the website for the podcast, that's www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com, where there are pictures relating to some of the episodes and other theatre-related stuff. If you have any questions, comments or concerns, you can always contact me by email on thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. (laughs) 